schmancy new, like, like sermon. Yeah, I know, right? It was tucked away in the back of the choir room. It's fascinating what you find in the back of choir rooms once they start, <laughs> once they start getting cleaned out a little bit. So I've mentioned a number of times that I have a clergy group that we, we do a conference call every Thursday where we kind of present our outlines of our sermons for the upcoming week. And we critique each other's sermons and we give each other ideas of things that we could uh, do to strengthen them, maybe some stories that we might be able to add, yada, yada, yada. And after I went through my uh, sermon outline this morning, my very good friend, the Reverend Dr. Dan DeLeon, who is down in Bryan College Station at Friends Congregational Church, who I've mentioned a number of times, said, man, do I have a story for your sermon. I was in middle school, and it was, I was in sixth grade, and it was the first time that I, I had to go from class to class to class to class, and I just didn't have one big homeroom where you stay in that same homeroom with one teacher all day long. And it was the first time that I ever had to buy gym clothes. Like before that, you could just wear whatever you wanted to at gym. But now, in middle school, they made you buy a specific pair of shorts and a specific t-shirt, which you had to dress out for gym every single day that you had gym class. And so my parents bought me these shirts and these, and these gym shorts, and it was by wearing the pair of shorts and the t-shirt that you got graded. You got an A if you wore the shirt and the shorts, and you got an F if you did not. It wasn't how many push-ups you could do, how, many, how, many, how fast you could run a mile. It wasn't how well you kicked a ball or if you progressed and improved during the year. Nope, your grade was solely based on whether or not you had the right shirt and the right shorts. And of course, being a kid with ADHD, D, he forgot his shorts all the time. He always remembered his t-shirt, but for some reason, he always forgot his shorts. And that every so often, you would get set up in a circle, and there would be an audit of the, of the classroom of the students, and Dan consistently and constantly showed up without his shorts. So one day, it was the day of the audit, and day, Dan walks in, and you can, you can see that the circle is already forming. And he knows that he's got his t-shirt in his backpack, but he's completely forgotten his shorts again. So he goes into the boys' locker room, he's wearing jeans, and he decides that he's going to take his jeans and roll them up above his knees. And then he's going to stretch his t-shirt as far down as he can possibly stretch it. And he walked out to get into the circle like this, and then he sat down in the circle around with his, with his classmates and his friends around him, and he leaned forward and put his elbows on his knees, hunched over, so that his teacher would not see that he wasn't wearing his shorts and that he wasn't wearing jeans that were rolled up to just above his knee. And as the, the gym teacher was making his way around the circle and kind of grading everybody on whether or not they were wearing the proper uniform or not, he got to Dan. And when his teacher saw Dan in his rolled up jeans and his t-shirt pulled down as far as it could and hunched over, he just looked at Dan and said, come on, man, you're not even trying. And that, I feel, is the same level of exasperation you can hear in God's voice in the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. Come on, man. Come on, woman. You're not even trying. And we don't want to try. We don't want to try with this story anymore. This is a story that is persona non grata. We stay away from this story as much as we possibly can. In progressive mainline churches, we hate Genesis 3 and 4. Amen. Amen. See, I just got, that's the first amen of the program here. And how did I get it? We hate Genesis 3. <laughs> Man, amens are easy around here. And we don't like it. And we don't give it the credit that it deserves. So I'm hoping to redeem it a little bit for you today. Because I think this, this story speaks some incredible spiritual truths that are some really good ideas for our lives. But for three main reasons, we don't want to deal with it. The first reason why we don't want to deal with it is because it's been weighed down in a post-enlightenment, post-modernist pendulum swing towards rationalism. 
And we don't want to just kind of let the, 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 the mysticism of the story speak to us. Postmodernism and rationalism has demythologized just about everything. And we are no longer, we look at the Bible now with a great deal of skepticism instead of allowing the spiritual truths just to speak to our hearts and allow them to be what they are. Now, one of the reasons why we have so much skepticism is because postmodernism has correctly pointed out that this story has been detrimental and shameful and hurtful for women and queer folk and people of color for too long. It has been used to shame women denigrate queer people, marginalize people of color. And so we in the church, instead of dealing with it and saying we are so sorry that the patriarchal Christian church for two centuries has done this, or two <laughs> eons have done, not two centuries, two eons have done this, we apologize, we will not do that anymore, please forgive us, and let us look at the truths of this story instead of using it to hurt and bash people. And then, in the last 150 years, this story has been at the center of the culture war and the exhausting battle between science and religion, as if those two disciplines ought to be at war with one another. So we avoid it. And I understand why. But I want to claim it. I want to take it back. Kind of like Bono said of the song Helter Skelter. We're going to claim it back. We're going to take it back for our own. Because this is an incredibly profound story that speaks to our awakening of our place within the immensity of the universe and just how vulnerable we are in this world. Of how God, how, how, how a sad God is when we lose that beautiful innocence that we used to have and God's anger at our attempt to cover up. I, I looked at a couple of etymological sites, that, which words and phrases, where do they come from? At least a couple of those websites, they could be wrong or right, have said that this is where we get the, uh, the, the, the term to cover up. That when we've done something wrong and we don't want to deal with it, we cover up using fig leaves. We'll get to that in a second. But instead of coming clean and admitting up front that we have done wrong and fessing up, we lie, and we, and, we, and we play these games. And then God asks us this incredibly magnificent, like, spiritual question that cuts to the quick and then teaches us that we have consequences for our actions and that our mistakes sometimes hurt people. But then God sends us on this incredible journey of redemption and reconciliation. But before we go on that journey, God makes sure that we have the provisions that we need. And that even though God may be angry and expel us from paradise, that doesn't mean that there is a limitation or an end to God's unconditional love and boundless grace. That's what I want us to hear this morning. That's what I want us to see in this story of Genesis 3. Not that stuff that has been twisted and turned to hurt people, but these profound spiritual truths. That's what we need to hear when we get this story right. But I have to admit, I didn't like this story for a long, long time. I was with Susan. Amen. Cut it out. Who needs it? But then this story was redeemed for me. Redeemed for me by Dr. Sarah Kearney who is the professor of biblical preaching at Luther Seminary in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I was at my conference, my, my, the Festival of Homiletics back in San Antonio this past spring, and there I heard Dr. Kerning give this amazing sermon that truly changed my life. This was the first time that Genesis 3 made sense to me. And more importantly, I could own it, this story, as my story, and I could let it speak to me, I could internalize it, and I could suss out the spiritual truths and truly live them out. Now that festival of homiletics was filled with some of the hall of famers of mainline progressive Protestantism. Walter Brueggemann, Otis Moss III, Amy Butler. But it was Dr. Kerning who truly spoke to my heart. And when I went back to my notebook of, that I just filled with notes listening to the, all these amazing sermons to get to Dr. Kerning's uh, amazing insight on Genesis 3, I found zero notes in my notebook. 
because I was so enthralled by her sermon that I forgot to write anything down. So this is where the sermon really gets bad. Because I'm going off of memory on what Dr. Kerning said. Dr. Kerning came up with two immense spiritual truths that really spoke to my heart from Genesis 3. The first spiritual truth is it is a futile attempt to try to hide from God. That no matter where you go or what you do, God will find you. Now, you can give it the old college try, but God's going to find you. Do we really think, Dr. Kearney said, that on this temporal, mortal plane, that there is a crevice, a crack, or a corner of this globe that you can hide from God? But oh, did the first man and the first woman try Oh, they gave it everything they had. When they found out that they were naked, they became incredibly scared. They ate that fruit, which some, some biblical scholars say was a pomegranate, not, a, not an apple. It doesn't really matter. They take the fruit, and when they eat it and they become knowledgeable about good and evil, the, they realize that they've been naked, they've been exposed, they've been vulnerable this entire time while walking through the Garden of Eden. And when they do find that out, they become so afraid. And when you feel vulnerable and you feel exposed and you feel naked, whatever that happens in your life to cause those things to occur, we get scared. And when we get scared, we make bad choices to cover ourselves up and to make sure that we don't have to deal with the consequences. Fear leads to incredibly bad decision-making sometimes. Sometimes it's good, fight-or-flight sort of things, but oftentimes it's so bad when we are afraid. And Adam and Eve, the first woman, the first man, they choose to look around their garden and say, well, what do we have, what resources are at our disposal so that we can get away with something that we weren't supposed to do? We're afraid of what God might do to us, and we're afraid that we're just naked. And so they look, and they pick fig leaves. These were picked this morning off the tree in Brock and Barbara Allen's house just around the corner on Alder. I don't know if you see what these fig leaves, how big they are. They're a big leaf. And I'm a normal-sized human being. I'm six foot one, 170 pounds-ish. It's going to take a lot of leaves <laughs> to kind of cover me up. And they don't have a lot of time. Secondly, I don't know if you've ever felt a fig leaf, but they're like sandpaper. And these are not necessarily the garments, the garments made out of these leaves that necessarily you want to put on your more sensitive areas. You might chafe a little. Then, these leaves were picked at 8.15 this morning. These are a little over two hours old, and you can already see that they're starting to curl and wilt. And we're talking about Bronze Age technology, wooden, wooden needles and twine. We're not talking about titanium sharp needles and synthetic thread. As these things bend and wilt, they're going to rip these things apart. There would be piecing these things together and trying to cover themselves up. It takes a lot. That is a lot of effort. And then, like children who have forgotten that they've aged and they're no longer infants, they go and play the worst game of hide-and-seek they possibly can. And Dr. Kerning says God walks through the Garden of Eden. We think that maybe like God's being quiet like a mouse. Dr. Kerning says imagine that God is stomping around, playing this incredibly innate game with the first woman and the first man. God knows where they are. And when God says, oh, where could they be? I can't see them. Just like you do with your two-year-old when they're playing hide-and-seek and they hide behind a lamppost. Or, uh, <laughs> and they're too big and they're spilling out. And yet, there are consequences to their decisions. Birth pangs and labor and being expelled from paradise. 
to go on this incredible journey which will make them scared so many more times. And yet God says, get rid of those silly leaves and let me give you something that will protect you and shelter you and keep you warm. There's an incredible grace at the end of the story of the Garden of Eden that God pieces together true clothing, not this haphazard stuff that they created after being scared. It's futile, Dr. Kerning says, to hide from God. And why would we want to? We could deny ourselves the amazing gift of God's amazing grace. Secondly, Dr. Kerning says the other spiritual truth of this story is that Genesis 3 is a story about Eucharist. That's right. This is a Eucharistic story. We often pair the Last Supper with Passover, but Dr. Kerning says pay attention to this story because there is a great deal of echo of Genesis 3 and Jesus breaking the bread and passing the cup to his disciples at the end of the, near the end of the Gospels. When you strip away all of the esoteric items of this story, talking snakes and, and magical fruit and God stomping through paradise, when you strip away the idea that God made a human being from mud and spit and another from a rib and really get down to the nitty-gritty of this story, you hear words like saw, took, ate, gave, were opened, were amazed, realized, made, heard, were called, were an they answered, and God asked. At the heart of this story are the echoes that will later be seen in the, in, in, in the Last Supper stories of the Gospels. They're almost the exact same verbs in that story that are in Genesis 3. And when I heard Dr. Kerning say this on the stage at the Festival of Homiletics, I remembered my own Eucharistic moment when I took communion for the very first time. And this magical mystery tour began in my life when the clouds split, the light shined. And I was sitting in a suburban Methodist church in San Antonio, Texas, and I saw a minister stand up at a, at a table and, see, and I saw him and he took bread and we, and, he, and we ate it and I was opened and I was amazed and I heard God's call in my life. And even though later I found out that that man had some snake-like qualities to him, it didn't matter. Because at that moment I was in paradise and I knew the difference between good and evil and I was blessed. But paradise is fleeting. It's temporary. But the journey is long and full of terrors. So God blesses us with Eucharist. We might be expelled from paradise, but we're given the gifts for the journey. We're not abandoned by God. God is with us each and every step no matter how vulnerable and exposed we get. But when you are vulnerable and you are exposed, you will have the temptation to get your own proverbial fig leaves and try to cover yourselves up. But when you do, you must resist that temptation because those fig leaves won't last and you will be left chafed. You'll put on the fig leaf of anger, judgment, pride, greed, violence. And they won't help you one bit. And when you do, you're going to hear the voice of God. Come on, man. Come on, woman. You're not even trying. We are called, we are created to live in deep relationship with each other and with God. And to do so requires nakedness, exposure, vulnerability. The last spiritual truth of this story is those are the requirements to live in paradise. You can't go back as much as we'd like to. There's an angel with a big flaming sword. 
we got to move forward with the provisions of God and God's unconditional love as we journey step by step to the new Eden. Won't you walk with me and with God until we get there? And that is the spiritual truth and the good news this day. Amen, amen. and amen.